house of Israel. But yet no one, no religious leader, no religious church, the Bible. Is it hard to understand? When it comes to reading the Bible, the first thing that comes to mind is the fact that this is the word of God. The house, the seals have been broken and the truth is here. And when we go throughout the scriptures, when we go throughout extra biblical records, we find that the language that God employed, that he used to create the heavens and the earth, was the Hebrew language. Christ said, I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But yet no one, no religious leader, no religious church out there anywhere can now identify the 12 tribes of Israel. Can we? God is quite simple, but it seems as if man makes understanding him hard. What are those mysteries? The truth of your book. And the truth will make you free. The Hebrew and Bible Academy, you're invited. Don't let me fall, give me the strength. 
Okay, family. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Before I do anything, let me first make sure that all is well. Let me first make sure all is well before we get started. Let me make sure the sound is good. Let's make sure you all can see me. And uh, once that's confirmed, we'll get right into today's broadcast. But I first want to make sure that all is well. I don't want to do anything before confirming that everything is good. Shalom to you all. All right, shalom. Okay, wonderful. All is clear. All right, again, shalom to you all. Shalom, Elder Dale. And um, before we do anything, let me just get a, a quick roll call to see where you all are viewing from this evening. All right, wonderful. All right, if you can, just put your city and your state next to your name so we can know who we have with us this afternoon. All right, all is good. Okay, great. Great. So who do we have with us? All right, we got Sister Nina from Dallas, Texas. We have Maria GOCC ATL from the Atlanta body. We can pretty much assume that based on the name GOCC or, or GOCC ATL. All right, who else we got here? All right, we got, I thought I saw Chicago there. Let me jump back. We got Sister Yolanda Hicks from Chicago. All right, shalom to the family out there in Chicago. We got Ak Dawada Benjamite from the Houston body. Shalom, Ak Dawada Benjamite. We got Kiosha Bellamy from Raleigh, North Carolina. Shalom, I'm assuming that's Sister Kiosha. Shalom, Sister Kiosha. We got S Lady 2 from Birmingham, Alabama. I'm assuming you're out there connected with our dear brother, Brother Ira. All right, who we're going to be working with very soon to set something up there in the Birmingham, Alabama area. We got Brother Derek Brown from Iowa City, Iowa. Shalom to Brother Derek Brown from Iowa. All right, let me see who else we have here before we get into it. All right, we got Sister Shannon Lloyd from GOCC South Georgia. Shalom to the family out there in South Georgia. In case you didn't know, our dear brother, uh, brother uh, Aaron, Officer Aaron, has been recently anointed Deacon Aaron. I'm pretty sure for those who saw the video from uh, this past weekend where we anointed some of the officers and raised them up to deacons. You all were able to witness that. So all praise be to the most high for that. And shout out to uh, Deacon Aaron out there in South Georgia. I believe Douglas to be exact. All right, we got Tamika Robb from Detroit, Michigan. Shalom to Sister Tamika from Detroit. Shalom to Sister Thalia from the Norfolk, Virginia area. All right, we got the Root of Sands from Hargada, Egypt. Shalom to the family out there still in Egypt. The Root of Sand. All right, we got Mrs. Taylor from Dover, Delaware. Shalom to you. And uh, we'll save the rest for the end. I see we still have quite a few people here from various areas throughout the United States and abroad. Again, if, if I didn't get to your name, shalom to you all collectively. Shalom to you all on this Preparation day before the Sabbath. I want to wish you all a hearty shalom. All right. As you all know, we're coming off the back of the Passover weekend, which was a blessed weekend, as you saw many of you in person with us there in North Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina. Some of you were able to witness the Passover from home, but nonetheless, we did our best to ensure that you were able to partake and, and kind of fill the experience as if you were there. So for those who watched it from home, hopefully you also had a blessed experience for this past Passover weekend. We are still currently in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I'll just go over that very quickly today. We are doing a brief Q&A um, as it pertains to Unleavened Bread or really any questions you may have in general. 
but we are in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And um, we're coming towards the end of that. Tomorrow uh, marks the end of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yes, it will be a double Sabbath. Sundown uh, will mark the end of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, which we'll also treat as a Sabbath day. Okay, we got Brother Nathan Tate saying, take me back. Shalom, shalom to Brother Nathania Allah. For you all who don't know, that is, if I'm not mistaken, that's the brother of Brother Rapaya Allah. All right, who many of you had the opportunity to meet for the first time this past Passover weekend with the performances. Um, you saw the performance of To Zion at the end, which tore the house down. Um, but... We got Brother Nathania Allah, which is the brother of Rapaya Allah. All right. Both coming from the uh, Maryland area, from the tribe of Gad. Shout out to both Rapaya Allah and Nathania Allah. All right. All right. Now, we, we, um, we'll, we'll discuss that. We'll discuss as far as the, the, the Sabbath. Okay. We'll, we'll discuss as far as the Sabbath, but... Um, yes, that is brother Nathaniel Allah again. Shalom to you. He said, take me back. And I'm pretty sure you all feel the same exact way, especially those who are in the building this past Sabbath, uh, this past, uh, Sabbath for the Passover. It was a blessed event. The energy that was in the place was special. All right. As we have mentioned, this is possibly, if not the best, the very best. Passover celebration that we have had. And that's not to take away from any, all the Passovers are blessed from the, the first Passover that we ever had going back to 1510 style street. That was a blessed Passover, right? That was actually my first Passover that I partook in. And, um, that was, that was special to partake in. And, um, every Passover from Vince has pretty much had its um, it's qualities, right? But, um, there was something about this last one that was just special. Okay. If, uh, I don't want to put any, any, any bad omens or any, any spirit out there, but, um, if that was the last Passover, okay, before things start to turn up, um, I think we would all be satisfied with that being our last Passover celebration. If things were to uh, go up in smokes, if you, if you will, from this point on, I'm pretty sure we would all be pleased with that being our final Passover celebration. And yes, as sister Ani B said, it gets better and better every year. And that's because every year we're improving processes. We're, you know, learning things every year. Okay. Um, this church, um, as you all know, is a working progress. All right. So every year things do get better and better. All right. So let's get into it. Um, someone said, what year was that? That Passover 1510 style street. I want to say anywhere between 2008, maybe 2009. Okay. 2008, 2009 was that first Passover that I partook in. 1510 style street in North Philadelphia, right off of uh 15 from, uh, I want to say broad street straight off, right off of broad street in Philadelphia. Okay. That was about 2008, 2009. All right. All right. Shalom to you all. All right. So let's get into it. Let's not waste any more time. Let's jump right into it. Someone said it was their first Passover in person. It was a blessed time. So if this was your first Passover, it's a blessing uh, because you just you just so happen to come in on the best Passover that we've had. But um, for those who have been in the previous Passovers, it's a blessing as well because you have been able to witness the progression of from year to year. Okay. Uh, someone said, is it just abstaining 
from already leavened foods like cakes, loaf breads? Do I need to worry about drinks or things that have yeast, uh, baking soda that are not leavened breads? And that is a very good question. All right. Um, we're going to quickly go to the scripture as it pertains to the original Passover celebration. Okay, I'm going to go there very quickly. In the book of Exodus, and we're going to get the um the instructions that came in succession after the original Passover was instituted. Okay? And I'm going to do this for a reason. Hopefully you all can see this. And it says here, And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 on foot. Let me get straight to the point. Verse number eight. And a mixed multitude went up also with them and flocks and herds and very much cattle. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they brought forth out of Egypt. So keep in mind that the original institution of Passover, the specific thing that was unleavened was the cakes of dough, the bread. Okay? This was the original thing that was unleavened. Okay? So, and they baked unleavened cakes of the dough, which they brought forth out of Egypt, for it was not leavened. So, in the original institution of Passover, we understand that the unleavened, ab abstaining from leaven, right, was primarily in respect to abstaining from unleavened bread. That was the original institution. I'm going to read this again. And they, speaking of the children of Israel, baked unleavened cakes of the dough. Right? So we understand that the institution of unleavened or abstaining from leaven was initially specifically pertaining to bread. Right? Which they brought forth out of Egypt, for it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry, neither had they prepared victuals or prepared themselves any victual. Right? So they were, they were excommunicated or better yet. Right? They were kicked out of the land of Egypt in haste. Right? exiled or excommunicated from the land of Egypt in haste, meaning quickly. They did not have any time to prepare anything, right? It tells us here in verses 33 and 34. Again, let me make sure you all can see verses 33 and 34. All right. Verses 33 and 34 tell us the following. This is why, this is going to give us the reason why we ate unleavened bread. Right? Then we're going to move on to later scriptures which deal with the institution of the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread to see why we also abstain from other products that also have leaven. Right? But this is the original institution. And what I'm showing is that in the original institution, the law or the, the custom was initially abstaining from leavened bread. So it says here in Exodus chapter 12, verse number 33, and the Egyptians were urgent upon the people and that they might send them out of the land in haste. So they wanted to quickly get us out of the land based on 
not all, not only all of the plagues that preceded the final plague, which was the 10th plague, right? We know water turned to blood, flies, gnats, boils and blains upon the people as well as their cattle. Uh, we know that the Most High caused darkness to come upon the land of Egypt. There were various plagues that the Most High sent forth, right? Frogs coming out of the waters, right? Into every um, water source throughout the land of Egypt. There were many things that the Most High did. And the final plague was pretty much the final straw for the people of Egypt. So with that final plague of causing the death angel to come through and to, to take the lives of all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, that caused them to be urgent upon us. Right? After that plague, they desired to quickly get us out of the land of Egypt. So it says the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they may send them out of the land in haste, meaning quickly. For they said, this is what the Egyptians said, we be all dead men. So they thought that eventually, if we don't let these people go, the Most High, their God, is going to kill all of us. So they said, let's get these people out of here quickly, lest the Most High kill all of us. Now here's the key point, verse 34. And the people meaning the people of Israel, took their dough before it was leavened. Here's the key. They took their dough. We know that dough is used to make what? Bread. Right? So this is very specific when we're dealing with the first uh, celebration, or, or better yet, the first instituted, Passover along with unleavened bread. So it says, and the people took their dough before it was leavened, meaning before yeast was added to the dough. Their netting troughs, meaning the instruments that are used to net your dough, their netting troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders, meaning their items right? Their belongings were already packed up, right? The Most High said what? Let's go up a few verses. He said to eat this with your shoes on your feet, pretty much ready to go, okay? Be ready to go no soon as you partake in this feast. Let me get that verse where it says, uh, eat with your shoes on your feet, and your loins girded. Let me get that very quickly. All right. One moment. One moment. All right. Verse 11. It says here, this is the same chapter, Exodus 12 and 11. And thus shall ye eat it, meaning thus shall ye eat the Passover lamb. That's the it that's being referred to with your loins girded and your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Meaning what? Eat this, prepare to leave, no soon as you are finished eating. Okay? Or better yet, partake in this feast, partake in this Passover lamb, already ready to leave no soon as you're done, right? So everything was already packed. So getting back to the point, this is why they couldn't leaven their bread, and this is why we keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread, right? So again, the initial institution of the Passover, the restriction of leaven was specifically pertaining to the dough, the bread, all right? But now you go to later... References to the uh, the Passover celebration, and it tells us the following. All right. In fact, it, it's here in the verse number 15. 
okay, in the same chapter. Verse 15 says, seven days, and it says here, this is, this is now for a later generation, right? And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, meaning even though this Passover is being instituted this day that you're in, you're still in the land of Egypt, you have not yet exited the land of Egypt, right? Even though you're going to celebrate the first Passover in Egypt, understand that this feast is to be a memorial, meaning even after you leave Egypt, you will, you must celebrate the Passover. So when you celebrate break the Passover in the future, this is the law that you must keep. And ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So again, the initial Passover was while we were still in Egypt. However, this feast day was to be a memorial for all generations. So even after they left Egypt, they kept the Passover. Meaning, while they were in the wilderness, they celebrated the Passover. When they entered the land of Canaan and established themselves in the land of Canaan, they kept the Passover. Okay? Reading on, it says, Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. So again, the Bible specifically ref uh, re refers to bread, right? Even the first day, now, let me make this clear. Let me go back here because people have this question. I believe I answered this question the last time we had this Q&A, but I'll just touch on this again. Hopefully by this time, all of you understand that when it says that seven days ye shall eat unleavened bread, this does not mean that you are to abstain from eating anything else outside of unleavened bread. And I say that because I've had this question before, not that it's a bad question. It's actually a good question because when you read the scripture, it says, seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. So some people may get the idea that when it says seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread, that that means that for seven days, I must eat only unleavened bread. And that's not the case. It's telling us that if you are to eat bread or if you decide to eat bread, that bread must be unleavened. That bread must not contain yeast. So it says, seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first, first day, ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. So this is how we celebrated the Passover in those future generations, where it tells us that it was to be kept as a memorial. So when we kept it in future generations, we put the leaven out of our houses. Right? So for this, for this sake... We not only abstain from bread products that have leaven, i.e. bread, cakes, cookies, or anything of that nature, right? We also abstain from other products that may have leaven, okay? Certain drinks that may have um, components of either um, um, baking soda or yeast or anything of that magnitude. Okay, we abstain to some degree from those things as well. Okay, so it says here, seven days shall you eat uh, beer. Okay, is an example for those who may be asking what drinks contain yeast. Beer is an example of a drink that contains yeast. Okay, so we abstain for this purpose from all of those things because the scripture says put all the leaven out of your houses. Right, but the initial institution of this law was specifically dealing with bread specifically, right? So it says here, first day you should put away leaven out of your houses for whosoever eateth leaven, leaven bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. So again, the law specifically highlights bread. Okay. The law specifically highlights unleavened bread. Right. So, again, some brothers and sisters, they again, they abstain from anything that contains leaven, yeast or what have you. And that's for conscience sake. Right. Because the law says or the scripture says to put away leaven out of your houses. So anything that contains leaven, they abstain from. 
but the law specifically is dealing with unleavened bread products. Okay. We personally abstain from anything that has leaven, whether it's food, drink, or what have you. All right. But hopefully that, that answers your question. Hopefully that answers the person's question. Right. Uh, uh, LD Iraq said un in Shalom LD Iraq said unleavened pancakes. Okay. Right. You can't extract the already fermented uh yeast and wine. Okay. That 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 can't be extracted, okay? All right. Um, someone says to clarify my DIY laundry soda is forbidden due to baking soda. No. Okay. No. Again. And this is, this is why we, um, it's a good thing you asked that question. That's why we, we do these Q and A's, even though sometimes they may seem you, you may think, or you may believe that people kind of got the, the, um, the understanding of this. Um, and the purpose of the unleavened bread. And that's why we say when it comes to this hot, this holy day to primarily focus on the spiritual aspect of the leaven, because sometimes you can go so far into the um, idea of what you abstain from physically when it comes to unleavened bread. And you should, to some degree, focus on what, what it is you are to abstain from physically. But so much time is spent on that that a lot of times we don't focus on the spiritual side of things, but answering your question, no. Okay. The baking soda that's in your laundry powder has nothing to do with the feast of unleavened bread. Remember this is pertaining to a feast, a festival where things are consumed, right? You're not eating your laundry powder, right? And that's why I, I, I want to make an emphasis that the primary thing that we were to abstain from when it came to the Feast of Unleavened Bread was bread that had yeast. Okay? Bread that had yeast. Let me read this again. Seven days shall ye eat. So this is specifically pertaining to things that are consumed. Things that are eaten, right? Not body products or cleaning products, right? Household products that may contain what? Baking soda. That's not what this is referring to. This is specifically in reference to things that are consumed. Ye shall eat unleavened bread. Bread is the primary thing that the scripture is dealing with. Now, again, for conscience sake, Many brothers and sisters may abstain from anything that has yeast for conscience sake. However, the law is specifically dealing with bread or let's say bread like products, cake, pancakes with leaven, um, cookies, things of that nature. That's the primary thing that the scripture is dealing with. Okay. So it says, even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses for whosoever eateth leavened bread. I want, again, I want to make the emphasis on bread. Okay. So that we don't go too far into looking at everything and, and thinking that we have to throw out everything that has uh, baking powder or baking soda, you know, cleaning products and things of that nature. That's not what the scripture is dealing with. Is specifically dealing with things that are consumed. Hopefully that answers that question. Okay. Exactly. As Elder Dell said, we cannot strain at a gnat. Someone has a question about blasphemy. The Holy Spirit will get to that. 
uh, before we jump to the other side. Exactly, toothpaste, deodorant that has baking soda. That's, that's not what the scripture is dealing with. Okay, and that's again, that's why I want to emphasize. So I want to emphasize, one moment, one moment. That's why I want to emphasize the bread aspect. Okay, it's not talking about eggs. It's not talking about rice. It's not talking about um, many of the other things that people may have questions on. Uh, my husband is not in the truth. Is it okay to allow him to have his white bread? Um, yes. I mean, if your husband is not in the truth and he don't, he has no clue as to why you're trying to put the bread out the house or take his bread away. So let your husband have his bread. If in the future he comes into the knowledge of the truth, then he'll understand why he is to abstain from bread at this time. But we don't necessarily try to impose or enforce these things upon people who have not accepted or adopted the faith or this understanding. Okay. This is specifically for those who have adopted and accepted this understanding. Those who actually have a re, uh, an, an understanding or reason as to why they're doing it. Someone who is not in the truth, who has no understanding, there's no reason to try to impose it upon them. Okay. Wine is fine, but uh, we tend to get wine that is kosher for Passover. Okay, there's cold. In fact, I picked up some yesterday, some wine that is kosher for Passover. Okay. I'll get that on the other side, the neither Jew nor Greek. I'll deal with that on the Patreon side. Uh, the waving of the sheaf will deal with that on the Patreon side. Right. Someone says I break, I brush my teeth with baking soda and coconut oil. I'm not break. Yes. This is again, again, let's go back to the scripture. Okay. Go back to the scripture. All right. I want to emphasize this so that we don't jump off the cliff. So that we don't jump out the window. Right. Let me emphasize going back to the book of Exodus <clears throat> 12 and 15. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day shall ye put away leaven out of your houses. Again, the emphasis is bread. For, whatso for whosoever eateth leavened bread, not useth laundry powder, not useth toothpaste, right? Not useth deodorant that has baking soda, but eateth leavened bread. All right? And that's going to, uh, at this point, I'll transition to the other aspect, the, the higher aspect, the higher understanding as to why we acknowledge this festival, because we understand that all of these things have their fulfillment in Christ, and that Christ is pretty much, as they say, Christ is the reason for the season for their holidays in the world, which we know is not the case. Christ is not the reason for the season when it comes to Christmas, Easter, or what have you. But we know that for the holy days in the Bible, Christ is, quote unquote, the reason for the season. Ultimately, when the Most High instituted these holy days, it was a foreshadowing of what would be done and fulfilled by Christ. Okay? When these things were instituted, the Most High had his only begotten son in mind the whole while or the whole time, right? So we always have to remember that when it comes to these holy days. So now as Christ comes along, not that we don't keep the customs and the traditions of our forefathers um, as far as abstaining from unleavened bread. We still deal with that, but we understand that there's a higher understanding to these holy days that is fulfilled in Christ. 
So I'm going to get that very quickly starting in the book. Let me get this very quickly in the book of Psalms chapter 40. Okay, Psalms 40. Okay, I'm going to read this real quick. Psalms 40. I'll start at verse number six. Right, Psalms 40 and six. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine heirs has thou opened. Now, that's how it's translated in the Masoretic text. But in the Septuagint, if I can go there very quickly, let me see if I have the Septuagint. I'm going to go there very quickly. All right, let me take that off. If we go to the Septuagint, let me see if it's in there. Right? We get the, the proper understanding of that scripture. Okay, we get the proper understanding of the scripture. This is the book of Psalms, chapter 40, verse number 6, in the Septuagint. All right, let me highlight it so you can see it, and I'll underline the key point. Psalms 40 and 6 in the Septuagint says the following. Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body has thou prepared me. But a body has thou prepared me. Meaning what? The institution of sacrifice and offering, which also was a part of the holy days, which was a part of the system of temple worship, instituted by the Most High under Moses for the Israelites. We understand that that system was set in place as a foreshadowing of what would be done and fulfilled in Christ. Right? The Bible says, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. So yes, there was a time period. In fact, let me go back. Right? I'm going to finish this point. I'm going to go back to get an example. There was a time in which sacrifices and offerings, right, the bloodshed of animals was instituted for the redemption of sins, right? As the Bible says, there is no redemption without bloodshed. Well, under the system of the old covenant, that bloodshed came by the way of animals, animal sacrifices. So let me go back very quickly to the book of Genesis, right? Because even before Moses, sacrifices were in place. But under Moses, things were codified, okay? Things were codified under Moses. But let me go here very quickly to our father Abraham, right? This is the KJV, and then we're going to jump back to Psalms 40 and explain. This is going to lead us into the next point of this before we close out and go to Patreon, and answer some questions. But it says here, in the book of Genesis chapter 22, verse number one, and it came to pass after these things, let me make sure you can see it. So yes, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abram, Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am. And he said, take now thine son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Right? So we all know the story. We know that the Most High did not intend for Abraham to sacrifice his son. Right? This, this was a test of faith. Right? But now let's get to the point. Verse number 11, and the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. So 
we can see here from the language that's being used that Isaac was, in this case, a foreshadowing, right? Not a reincarnation as some teach. Some people teach that Christ is Isaac reincarnated. That's foolishness. But we see that Isaac, in this case, was a foreshadowing of Christ because we understand that Christ is the only son of the Most High, the only begotten son. So in this case, Isaac is being referred to as the only son of Abraham. Let's go back up. Verse number two. Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. So even though Abraham also had other children, such as Ishmael, later Abraham would also have other children by Keturah, right? We understand that Isaac was elected to be the son of the covenant, and therefore he is called the only son of Abraham. Now again, this is a foreshadowing of the Most High's only son, right? The Most High's only begotten son. If we can go to the book very quickly of Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 17. I'll read this very quickly. I know this is kind of going off track, but it's, I'm going to transition. Verse 17, by faith, Look at the language is being used in Hebrews 11 to describe Isaac. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son. I'm going to read that again. He that received the promises, Abraham, offered up his only begotten son, who was the only begotten son of uh, Abraham, Isaac. Right? Just like Christ, even though the Most High has many sons, we know that the angels are called son of God, sons of God. We know that the book of John says that as many as received Christ, gave he power to become the sons of God. So we know that those who receive Christ are also the sons of God, but Christ is the only begotten son, right? He is the firstborn of every creature, right? So that same language that's being used or that's used to refer to Christ as the only begotten son of the most high is the same language being used to refer to Isaac, all right? I know this may be going over some people's heads at this time but I'm using this as an example. Now I'm going to go back to the story of Genesis 22 as it relates to sacrifice. All right. So uh, going back here to the book of Genesis chapter 22 in seven, it says here, and Isaac spake to Abraham, his father and said, my father. And he said, here am I, my son. And he said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb? For a burnt offering. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So all of this was a foreshadowing. Keep in mind, we're talking about sacrifice, the sacrifices, right? God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. What did John the Baptist say when he saw Christ come on the scene? He said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. That's in John the first chapter. Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Okay? So we know ultimately the lamb that God would provide for an offering would be his son. But before those sacrifices came, the Most High let it be known that until that took place, 
that animals were to be offered. Right? So it says, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. So after Isaac was taken off from the altar, a lamb came along and was caught in a thicket. Now I have imagery of this in some of the uh, archaeology books that I have here. I don't see any of, any of them in eye shot, so I'll leave it until another time. But there's archaeology you can find from ancient Mesopotamia depicting a ram caught in a thicket. Right? In fact, let me see if I can... Eh, yeah, I'll leave it for another time. I'm already past the time that I desire to be on this side. I should be on the Patreon side by now, but I just want to transition to make this point before we go to the other side. Okay, let me make sure you all are still with me. All right. Okay, great. Okay, you all are still with me? Okay, wonderful. All right. So it says here, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. So what did Abraham do with this ram? And Abraham went, went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. What, would the, what was this signifying just on a simple level, just on a plain level? What was this signifying? This was signifying that until the Lamb of God comes to be offered, for the sins of the world, as it tells us in the book of John, the first chapter, before the only begotten son of God is sent to be a sacrifice for sins, Abraham, you are to offer animals, right? You are to offer animals for sacrifice until the true lamb comes. And that leads us back to the book of uh, Psalms, the 40th chapter, many people may ask, well, it says sacrifice and offering thou what is not. How could that be the case when we know that the sacrificial system was instituted in the old Testament by the most high, right? Noah sacrificed, Abraham sacrificed, Isaac sacrificed, Jacob sacrificed, uh, Moses, uh, sacrificed, right? The Levitical priesthood sacrificed the children of Israel sacrificed. So how could it say sacrifice and offering thou what is not? Well, that sacrificial system was simply placed instead or was a, a placeholder better yet for the ultimate sacrifice, which is Christ. And that's what we're explaining here in the book of Psalms. So sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Now it says here, mine ears has thou opened, but we know according to the Septuagint, it gives us the same rendering that we find in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse number, I think about seven. Okay. So sacrifice and offering thou what is not, but a body has thou prepared me. Meaning that ultimately the plan from the beginning was to offer or to eventually send forth the true sacrifice, which was the body of Christ. That's what it means when it says, but a body, meaning the body of our Lord and Savior, has thou prepared me. So going back to the KJV, it says, here's the key point. Then said I, lo, meaning behold, I come. Now we have to identify the I. Who's the I? That's coming. Well, we're going to prove that the I is Christ. It's not David who is writing this. We know that David is the author. It says here to the chief musician, a Psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. So we know that David is the author. However, we also know that David does not come in the volume of the book. Right? Right? David does not come in the volume of the book. So we know that this is not speaking of David. We also know that King David, throughout the Psalms, 
spoke through the Holy Spirit. Okay? He spoke through the Holy Spirit. And many of the things that he spoke through the power of the Holy Spirit were things which pertain to Christ. Right? Example, I hate to jump around. Again, I'm here longer than I desire to, but we're going to get this very quickly for those who may be new, who may not be familiar with some of these concepts. Let's go here to the book of Acts chapter 2, verse number 29. In fact, let me start up a few verses in verse number 25. Acts 2 and 25, for David speaketh concerning him. So when David was speaking, there's references in the book of Psalms where he's speaking solely of himself. There's references where he's speaking of himself, but those things that happened to David historically had their foreshadowing of Christ. And then there were things that were specifically pertaining to Christ. So it says here in the book of Acts, this is Peter speaking. All right, let me jump up here. Verse 22, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Yeshia of Nazareth or Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, meaning what? What happened to Christ was predetermined. It was already prophesied. And the foreknowledge of God, as I mentioned earlier, many of the things we see in the Old Testament, such as with Abraham and Isaac, was a foreshadowing, right, of Christ. And was done by the foreknowledge of God. The Most High knew when he instituted the sacrificial system that eventually it would be fulfilled in his son. That's an example of things being done to Christ by the foreknowledge of God. It was already established and prophesied and set in place from what? The foundation of the world. You have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God have raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he shall be holden of it, meaning death could not withhold Christ. We understand that he overcame death, as it tells us in the book of Hebrews, the second chapter, how he overcame death, right? So it says here, for David, here's the key point, for David speaketh concerning him, meaning David spoke concerning Christ. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He is on my right hand that I should not be moved. So this is David speaking, right? This is a quote from Psalms. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou will not leave my soul in hell. So when David wrote these Psalms, he was writing them in the first person. So it would lead one to believe that when David was writing these Psalms, that he was writing primarily of himself. Right? When in many cases, even though it's in the first person, he's speaking of Christ, right? All right. One moment. All right. All right, so we understand that he's speaking of Christ because thou will not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou was made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now here's Peter giving the understanding. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and his sepulchre is with us unto this day so what is peter saying 
When David says, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption, David was not speaking of himself. In fact, if you would like, we can take you to the gravesite of David that is set up or was set up in the days, even in the days of Peter and the apostles. He was saying that if you want to see David, we can take you to his gravesite, his sepulchre, and show you David. Right? So he said, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. And his sepulchre is with us unto this day. He is still buried. Meaning what? When he said that in the Psalms, that will not leave my soul in hell, he was not speaking of himself. Therefore, being a prophet, and here's the key point. Therefore, being a prophet, meaning what? The spirit of prophecy was upon David when he wrote many of these Psalms. When he said, I come in the volume of the book, even though he's writing in the first person, that's the spirit of prophecy on David, speaking of one that would come and would be written and documented and prophesied and fulfilled in the volume of the book, that one being Christ. So therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So that's the key point. So going back to the book of Psalms 40 and 7. Right. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. Again, David being a prophet was speaking in the spirit of prophecy of one that would come. So I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Who told us in the book of St. John, the sixth chapter, that they came not from heaven to do their own will, but the will of the Father that sent him, Christ. Thy law is within my heart. So why do I go here? Transitioning over to the New Testament, I go here to show that many, in fact, all of the things, all of the uh, holy days and, and various practices, um, they were foreshadowings of Christ. And that uh, ultimately, when we celebrate these holy days, we have to celebrate them with a new found understanding. Right? So when we're looking to remove the leaven from our houses, when we're looking to abstain from eating leavened bread, we have to do that with a new found understanding. And that newfound understanding is just more than abstaining from leavened food products. Not to say that we don't keep that custom. We still keep that custom, right? But understand that there's a newfound understanding on that. There's a, there's a, a, a reformed mindset that must come with that. As I'm putting the leaven out of my home, so to speak, as I'm abstaining from the leaven food products, there must be a spiritual mentality that's as associated with the physical activity of abstaining from leavened bread. So I'm going to get to that point very quickly, but I want to read this right here in the book of Hebrews 10. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come. We know that the Feast of Unleavened Bread is documented where? In the law. We know that the Passover is documented where? In the law. So it says, for the law, having a shadow of good things to come. So those things in the law, like the Passover, like the Feast of Unleavened Bread, were foreshadowings of good things to come. What's the good things to come? Christ and his fulfillment of these laws, these commandments, these, these prophecies. And not the very image of the things can never, with those sacrifices, which they offer it year by year continually, make the comers there unto perfect. So it's specifically going into what? The Day of Atonement, the sacrifice for the Day of Atonement, right? It actually quotes Hebrews, or not Hebrews, it quotes Psalms 40, um, what we just read. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will. I'm, I'm going to read verse 5 very quickly because... Um, 
We read the Septuagint version, but I'm going to show you here in the New Testament, okay, that it agrees with the Septuagint in regards to uh, the Psalms in 40, 40 and 7 rendering. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body has thou prepared me. Right? So that's the, that's the proper understanding. A body was prepared to take away our sins. Right? But um, getting to the point, last scripture before we conclude and transition, uh, 1 Corinthians 5. So I may mention that there must be a reformed, newfound understanding when we're keeping these feast days including Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread. Here's the newfound understanding. Purge out the old leaven that ye may be a new lump. A new lump of what? A new lump of dough. Right? That same dough we read about in the book of Exodus 12, where it says that they, um, let me go back there very quickly. Right, where it speaks about that dough, that lump of dough. Okay, book of Exodus chapter 12. And verse number, let me see here. And the people took their dough before it was leavened. When it speaks about a new lump, speaking about a new lump of dough. Okay, so going back to the book of 1 Corinthians 5, therefore let us keep the feast. In fact, verse 7, purge out therefore the old leaven. What is Paul referring to when he says purge out the old leaven? Right? That's, um, that's Paul using the language of the Old Testament, the law, to explain how we are to keep the feast in this time on a spiritual level, right? So he says, purge out the old leaven. In the Old Testament, it says, seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses. So in ancient times, we physically purged the leaven out of our house, houses, removed the leaven from our houses. So Paul is using this to explain the spiritual aspect of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He says, purge therefore out the old leaven. The same way you cast the leaven out of your house in the old covenant, in the old way, you must do that in the new covenant with the new way, a reformed way, right? A newfound understanding, a spiritual way. Not saying, because Paul's going to make it clear, he's not saying not to keep the Passover, not to keep unleavened bread, but as you keep that feast day, you must keep this in mind as well. Purge out the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. The same way that dough was unleavened when we came out of Egypt. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The same way the lamb in the Old Testament was sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the feast. So Paul didn't say do away with the feast. Paul said, understand, Paul was letting us know to understand that this feast was fulfilled by Christ. Christ said, think not that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. So Christ fulfilled the Passover. Christ fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So what does that mean? For many, they'll say, well, you don't have to keep it because he fulfilled it. No. We keep it with the newfound understanding that Christ has delivered to us. So we keep the Passover. However, we're not dealing with the sacrifice of a lamb exactly as, as, was, as was instituted in the book of Exodus 12. All right? We keep the feast days, but we're not doing it under how it was done under the Lev Levitical priesthood. Okay? So therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, not with the old way. Also, the old leaven represents sin when you deal with the context. Neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. 
So in other words, as you're examining the ingredients on your various products, your bread products, cakes and cookies out there, and the other products that you're examining to make sure that you don't consume leaven, also examine yourself. As Paul said last scripture in the same book of 1 Corinthians 11, in reference to the Lord's Supper, which is the Passover, right? Says here, verse number 28, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread. Okay? So a lot of times the focus is solely on the consuming of the bread. All right. What bread products you are partaking or, or abstaining from or what have you. Paul says, let a man examine himself. And we know that this is, this is dealing with communion, but also the Lord's Supper, which is the Passover, the biggest communion of the year. It says, let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Speaking of the communion, one of which we take also at the Passover, the Lord's Supper. So again, a lot of time goes into examining the bread. Much more time needs to go into examining ourselves. Again, not saying that I want to make this clear, not saying that we don't keep the custom of unleavened bread. We kept it this week. However, seven times, 10 times, a hundred times more uh, much more examination or more time should be put into examining oneself to ensure that we are not carrying the leaven of malice and wickedness. That's ultimately the point I wanted to make. Okay. Scriptures aren't updating on the screen. That's fine. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We'll, we'll go back here. That was useless. <laughs> if things weren't updated on the screen, I'm sorry for that. I thought things were moving along. Nonetheless, hopefully you all get the point from the scriptures that were um, put up. Okay. All right. At this time, we're going to transition to the other side. Okay. The uh, Patreon side to answer some of the questions you guys had here. All right. So elder, does this mean you remove everything out of your home physically? Um, that was the custom. The custom was to remove the leaven physically out of your house. Okay. But again, understand, look, I understand brothers and sisters may not be in a, a, um, a position to just remove everything out of their homes, um, that has leaven. Okay. After the week is up, you can go back to eating those things. So if you would like to just take those things, put it away, maybe put it in a, um, what do you call it? A storage container, right? Um, or somewhere in your pantry, somewhere where your pantry is. And, uh, when the seven days is up, put it back in there. Okay. If you would like, but again, again, we want to focus on the, the primary aspect, which is abstaining from eating or, or abstaining from spiritual leaven, which is the key point. And I always want to make that emphasis because we can, we can spend all day trying to figure out what products we, we can, we can eat what products we, we can, we can do that all, all day. Okay. But let me, let me leave you with this scripture. Okay. One last scripture. Hopefully this time it'll show up on the screen. Let me go here. Hopefully this time you'll see it. Let me use a different Bible app, which will not present that as an issue. Okay, there it is. All right, there it is. I don't know why I wasn't updating the last time, but let me see here. We're in the book of Romans chapter two. Okay, in fact, two more scriptures. Let me get another one. Second Corinthians 13 and five, it says here. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Don't just focus on examining the, the, the food products. Examine yourself, whether ye be in the faith. Know ye not your own selves, how that Yeshua Mashiach, or Jesus Christ, is in you, except ye be reprobates? 
Last but not least, going to the book of Romans, the second chapter. It says here, Therefore thou art excusable, inexcusable, O man, whosoever that thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou, O man, that judges them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Now check this out. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth to repentance? Uh, here's a key point I wanted to get. Here it is. Verse number 17. Uh, Behold, thou art a Jew, as many of us confess and profess, and restest in the law, and make thy boast of God. So this is usually what you get from one who professes to be an Israelite. They rest in the law, stand upon the law, make a boast of the Most High, right, in the law. The whole focus is, how do you keep this versus that, so on and so forth, and not to say that those things aren't important. But Paul is going to make a, 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 a very um, profound and important statement that we must all keep with us, especially when it comes to a uh, holy day such as this, where self-examination is to be the chief order of the day. So it says, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law, and are confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness. And this is what you'll hear from Israelites. They got the truth. They got the knowledge and the understanding. They got the law. They're going to tell you what laws you're not keeping, what laws you should be keeping, so on and so forth. And again, those things are not, not to say that those things aren't important. But look, check out what Paul says. An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and truth in the law. Thou therefore which teaches another, teachest not thou thyself. So these are the things we have to examine. When it says, let a man examine himself. Right? Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Here's the things we must examine, especially for those who are, uh, who make boast in the law. Thou therefore which teaches another, teachest not thou thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? So these are the things we must examine within ourselves. Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. Okay? So this is an example of some of the things we must examine within ourselves to make sure that the leaven is removed. Not just from our houses, our physical houses, but also our spiritual houses, our bodies. So um, I'm going to leave you with that. Um, for those who are in the academy this coming week, we have a lesson dealing with finding the Ark of the Covenant. There's many theories out there, many claims out there pertaining to the Ark of the Covenant. What happened to it? Um, is it still on earth? Was it taken into heaven? Was it hidden? Um, so on and so forth. There's many theories out there. There's theories out there that say that there's a particular people walking the earth right now who have possession of the Ark of the Covenant. Well, is that true? And if not, what does the Bible say about the Ark of the Covenant and its whereabouts? All of that and more we're going to be discussing in our upcoming le lesson this Sunday, Finding the Ark of the Covenant. We do have an upcoming academy. Uh, we uh, uh, This week is going to be week number 11. After that, we'll have week 12. We'll have a short break. 
And then we'll we'll make sure, obviously, in fact, let me get it up here very quickly. One moment. Let's see if we have the date for the upcoming Academy. If not, we'll keep you posted, obviously, on the upcoming date or the date for the upcoming Academy. Right. Also, if you all don't know, we have a new website. Let me make sure I show you all this. We have a brand new website. How would I do this here? Let's go to here. And let's go there. All right. So this is our website. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful page, beautiful website. Okay. As you all can see, beautiful website, right? Let's go to the Hebrew and Bible Academy. For those who are interested, this is where you would actually get all the information you need for the Academy. All right. It's where you would get all the information you need to enroll in the Academy. Right. So we will be making sure that we um, upload the date, the new date for the up and coming Academy. We'll keep you all posted nonetheless. All right. Let me conclude here so that we can go over to the other side on Patreon and answer a few of these questions. I'll try to remember some of the questions you guys asked. Let's go back and see if I can find some of these questions. Let's see. There were some questions that were asked earlier. I should have wrote them down. I don't think I can find some of these questions here. Try to scroll all the way up. Nonetheless, I'll try to find them on the, and we'll work our way to the other side. Nonetheless, bless you all and shalom. If it be the Lord's will, uh, myself and Elder Akashiar will be here tomorrow for the Sabbath lesson. Right. And then afterwards, this Sunday, we will be coming back with the Hebrew and Bible Academy. Again, the lesson for Sunday will be finding the Ark of the Covenant. Right. Oh, yes, here it is. Can you explain neither Jew nor Greek scripture? We'll explain that on the other side. Do we keep the waving of the sheaf spiritually? Again, hopefully I answer that question with Christ being a fulfillment of many of those things. Waving the sheaf offering. OK, understand that waving the sheaf. Um, that's that's a, that's pertaining to what uh, crops. Right. So if you don't have crops, there's no way you can wave a sheaf of your, your first fruits. If you don't have a, if you don't have crops. Okay. Remember the most I prophesied that what now there's brothers and sisters that do have crops. If you want to wave the sheaf, Hey, uh, by all means. Right. But again, um, a majority of these things have their fulfillment in Christ, right? Christ speaks about the Bible speaks about Christ being the first fruits from them that have, uh, risen from the grave. In fact, let me get that very quickly. Right. And it also speaks about the apostles, the holy apostles of Christ being the first fruits of uh, Christ's ministry. Okay. In fact, I'll deal with this on the other side. Uh, let, let me, let me get out of here so that we can transition. Bless you all. Shalom. May you all have a blessed Sabbath. I will see those who are on Patreon on the other side, right? Everyone else, I will see you if it be the most high's will tomorrow for the Sabbath lesson. Shalom, wabaraka thumb, or shalom and blessings. Well, bless you all.
the Bible. Is it hard to understand? When it comes to reading the Bible, the first thing that comes to mind is the fact that this is the Word of God. The seals have been broken, and the truth is here. And when we go throughout the scriptures, when we go throughout extra biblical records, we find that the language that God employed, that he used to create the heavens and the earth, was the Hebrew language. Christ said, I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But yet no one, no religious leader, no religious church out there anywhere can now identify the 12 tribes of Israel. Can we? God is quite simple, but it seems as if man makes understanding him hard. What are those mysteries? The truth of your book. And the truth will make you free. The Hebrew and Bible Academy, you're invited.